Yeah, so thank you very much. Um, the organizers did a wonderful thing here. I don't know if it was intentional or not, but uh, m what I'm going to present you immediately following what we've just seen is uh, particularly uh, interesting and extremely relevant. I hope you see that. And for the uh, benefit of the live audience here, we're going to get at the 22 people who may view this on YouTube at some point in the future, and I might do something that you will kind of get, and they won't get, and they won't know why. <laughs> so now you got something for being here for, on live. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story, and it's going to go back to talking about my father, Richard George Abow Jr., uh, the sole proprietor and owner of RGA Action Films, the uh, cameraman, the producer, he did it all. Um, I had a very large family growing up. I was uh, the 10th of 12 children growing up in suburban Detroit, and my father was an 8mm film enthusiast, and he recorded the goings-on in the history of our family over 50-some years. Uh, so now instead of seeing lots and lots of data about a small period of time, there's lots and lots of data about a long period of time here. Uh, my father meticulously gathered all of this family movie every year into a single one hour long reel that we would enjoy occasionally going back and viewing. Oh, let's look at 1967 tonight, Dad. Uh, um, unfortunately, uh, in 1998, my father died. And when he left, uh, it was no longer possible for us to view uh, th these 8 millimeter films because we realized that he was the one keeping the projector alive as well. So what I did, uh, fortunate being at a technical university, having lots of talented students, uh, we together built, uh, digitized the entire archive, built a simple um, annotation environment that would allow me to be able to annotate, browse, and semi-automate the annotation so I could now take the 35 years of, of video and very easily scan through it and browse and find relevant episodes. So no longer was I constrained to seeing things uh, one year at a time. I could go pick all the Christmas episodes from the 1960s. And this resulted in two very important things. Number one, I told you I'm one of a large family. I now had a way to give my brothers and sisters very meaningful but extremely cheap presence, <laughs> extremely important. The other thing, as you see, academics, one of the benefits of our lifestyle is that we get a lot of chances to go and travel, and we get to talk to lots of people. Lots of brothers and sisters, lots of relatives, they're all over the country. I had numerous opportunities to be able to very easily publicly embarrass my relatives by pulling up episodes of their past for everyone else to see very easily. Th th these were wonderful accomplishments, and I thought they were so important that I wanted to pass them on to my children. I want them to have the ability to build those kinds of gifts and to be able to publicly embarrass their father or their siblings. Uh, so what I did, and this is where there's gonna be a strange twist from what you saw uh, um, earlier about what uh, Deb Roy had done, is, uh, oh yeah, by the way, in case you hadn't figured out, that was me in the picture. I knew you knew it was me because it was the more intelligent looking one of the three in that picture. <laughs> Uh, but now what I want to show you is what happened in the process of converting my own family movies starting from about 1997 uh, through at this time about uh, 2002. And I want you to notice, I'm going to show you two very short clips of my oldest son, Aiden. In this first clip, can you tell us how old you are? Very cute. He gets all of his good looks from his dad. <coughs> yes. Um, so now we're going to fast forward eight, eight months, and we're going to take another clip of a, a view of this same individual, Aiden, at 28, 26 months. So where you saw before an 18-month-old child who was uh, had exchanging glances with his mother and father, responding to requests to point out body parts, you would have expected by the time it's over two years old, the emergence of language. You didn't see any language there. You saw some curious kind of body movements and things. It was a few months after this point that my oldest son, Aiden, was diagnosed with mild to moderate autistic disorder. Um, now, when I was viewing these, I already knew that he had the diagnosis, and in fact, at that time, my second son had a diagnosis of autism. And this struck me in the face, because not only is it poignant for me to see as a parent, my son demonstrate typical development and then plateau and even lose certain skills. He, to this day, still does not speak. But what struck me was that here I was as a researcher, spending a lot of my time helping to record and capture the past, 
annotate it so you could effectively view it, and then being able to see it. And what slapped me in the face was, wow, uh, I could see this progress or lack of progress and, and the loss of skill in my own son. And this was poignant, but also very inspirational because I said, okay, th th there's a reason I'm seeing this. It's to tell me that I can take my work and I can start to direct it to this issue of challenges surrounding the field of autism. And so that's the, the kind of personal motivation for why I'm doing that, uh, this particular work. And you see me uh, now today with my oldest son, Aiden, uh, there, and my next son, Blaze. Aiden's 13, Blaze is 10, and Mary Catherine is 6, myself, my wife, and my, and my mother uh, um, there. And so now I want to tell you a little bit about how I've gone from that moment of inspiration to try, as a computing researcher, think how I might use my skills and tools to try to make a difference in a problem that affects me personally, but affects a lot of people. So those who don't, uh, aren't that familiar with autism, you probably are, uh, um, given the amount of press we have these days, and know that April is the Autism Awareness Month in, in the US. It's a neurological condition that also has social elements to it, and it's defined by a triad of behaviors that, that are observed. Uh, the evidence of unique reciprocal social interactions, how you interact with the world, how you manifest your communication or language skills, and the kind of focus or focus to the point of repetition in activities or thoughts. But though we'd have these kinds of definitions, what you would know if you looked very closely at all at autism is that there's a lot about this that we do not understand. It's shocking how much we don't understand. But as I've uh, explored this both personally and professionally, it's clear that one of the reasons we don't know a lot about this is that we do not have the right way of exploring and viewing and understanding this phenomenon of autism. And I think this is where we have lots of opportunities uh, for, for our computing research. So I ask myself this question, what can computing do? And the short answer is a lot, an awful lot it can do. But what I'm gonna try to do in the rest of this talk is just give you two examples of what you can do using the tools of computing, the sensing, the, uh, uh, the, the, the networking capabilities to address very significant challenges in the field of autism. The first one I'm gonna talk about is what I'll call behavior imaging. And this is trying to provide eyes that view both what is seen and heard and that which is not seen as a means of understanding and discovery of this phenomenon we call autism. And it's primarily for the point of helping those who want to uh, research and provide treatment for individuals. But the other thing I'm going to wrap up with is looking at what I'm calling socially computed life skills. How might you help people to, uh, um, to be able to harness human intelligence to solve everyday life uh, challenges to promote independence. And this is really targeted at the individuals and their uh, uh, caregiving network. So the first one, behavior imaging. I'm going to develop this with a, through analogy with a very simple story. Imagine you are the parent of a small child and that child has a toothache. What are you going to do? You're going to call the dentist probably. And you're probably going to talk to the dentist and the dentist is going to ask you some questions. Well, you know, where is the tooth? How long has it had it? And uh, you might get some satisfaction from the questions they're asking and the answers you give. But would you think that a modern day dentist would stop there? No. You'd schedule an appointment, you'd go in to see the dentist, and then the dentist would have the child open the mouth and look in and feel around and ask some questions and see the reaction. Would you think that the uh, dentist would stop there? No. You'd expect the dentist to do something more, unless, of course, we were in the 19th century, and maybe that would be it. I'll talk to the parent, I'll look at the child, and then I'll do what needs to be done. But I'm sure all of you wouldn't go to a dentist like that. You wouldn't give them your hard-earned money to take care of your child. Now, you'd expect them to take a look at what's going on. Use an x-ray to look inside the mouth and see what can't be seen with the, with the physical eye. We expect that. But now let's look at, and, and this actually happens in many medical fields, and it has impacted our understanding of various uh, uh, medical opportunities and the treatment of individuals. But let's reflect now about autism. Well, I think if you look at the practice, the research, the diagnosis, the treatment and interventions and our understanding of it, I would argue that we're still using 19th century tools to try to address this 21st century phenomenon. We rely on parent reporting. We ask parents how their children spoke, how they responded in social situations. We bring a child into a doctor's office and in a three minute period of time, in an unnatural setting, we observe how that child responds to a social phenomenon and we make a judgment about where that child sits on a spectrum uh, disorder or a spectrum phenomenon as, as I prefer to call it. 
It's no wonder that we don't make a lot of progress in a field like this because we have very impoverished tools that we're trying to make sophisticated decisions about. But this is not just something that is, I'm, I'm pointing out as a, a, a point of woe and in in, in damning the field. I think this is a wonderful opportunity for us to try to address and improve upon. And so what we've been doing and what we've been lucky to get money from the National Science Foundation to try to explore is say how can we take experiences and natural environments with multiple people and figure out what's going on there for the purpose of understanding the development of a small child. So here in our child study lab here on the campus of Georgia Tech, we have an example of an interaction happening between a therapist sitting on the right who's observing a child's social communication skill and that child is accompanied by his mother. But what you don't necessarily see here is that we have some sophisticated sensing all around the room that sees what the eye can see so that we can analyze it, that hears what the ear can hear so that we can analyze that further or, and analyze them together. More importantly, what we can't see and can't hear, we might be able to detect on the surface of the skin of the child. So looking at autonomic nervous system responses to determine levels of stress or to explain shy behavior things that help us interpret what we can see and hear, but uh, that doesn't give us the full picture. But we can also instrument the objects in the environment to tell us something about how they're being manipulated. And all of this can be pulled together to help the clinical judgment that the, uh, the woman on the right here is trying to do to try to figure out, is there a source for concern for this particular child? So we can provide behavior imaging tools to help a behavioral scientist or clinician do a better job of exploring and understanding the phenomenon when a child presents themselves. And it's not just restricted to diagnosis. When you have a child that has a developmental delay, there are many different kinds of treatments that, that we try to subject them to to try to help them or to try to help us figure out what's going on with them. And many of these practices today involve lots and lots of data collection on paper that we then have to analyze. And so what we've done over the last decade here at Georgia Tech is to replace those practices with opportunities to collect data automatically and make it easier for a professional to be able to synthesize and review lots of information regarding how many different people are interacting with a particular person. All for the point of making the evidence-based decisions based on more and better evidence so that you can know whether something is working for a particular ch child or not. So now I want to go from behavior imaging, which is taking the tools of sensing and allowing us to see this phenomenon of autism better, to something that's more directed toward the individual, and what I'll call socially computed life skills. So it's every parent's dream, and in some cases a nightmare, that their child will move away for a variety of reasons. They go on to college, they get a job, they fall in love, they want we want them to have an independent life. But for many individuals on the spectrum, the possibility of independence is there, but there is a concern. There's a concern that some of the mundane, everyday activities of life are going to become tremendous blocks to being able to survive, to being able to hold down a job, being able to have a relationship, being able to wash and bathe, go to the bathroom. All these things become a concern every single day when you've got individuals. They may exhibit inc incredible intelligence in some areas, but incredible impoverished capabilities in, in other fields, in other areas of their lives. And this becomes a big concern for a parent. This is my biggest concern for my oldest son. But if we think about it, we live in a social world, right? And we're often in socially awkward situations, right? How should we respond to these socially awkward situations? <laughs> Right? Sometimes our responses are appropriate, sometimes they're not. Sometimes we know if they're appropriate, sometimes we don't know. So the challenge for individuals on the autism spectrum is that they have to learn these rules in order to survive in a social world, even though they might not understand why those rules are the way they are. So how can you help someone exist in a, in a social world? Well, we've seen a lot of talks today you know a lot about the emergence of technology. I want to cite one particular example that's more than almost two decades old. Nicholas Negroponte, who founded the MIT Media Lab, wrote this book on being digital. And in there, he talked about a world, a wonderful world of technology, in which my right cufflink could speak to my left cufflink, as mediated by a satellite up in the world. Oh, well, that's fantastic from a technology perspective, but pretty meaningless to me 
as an individual who cares about how am I going to be able to reach both of my boys if and when and where they need my help so that I don't have to be there all the time. Right? That's where I think the real opportunity is for us to be able to connect between individuals and use technology to support that. And there's been such an emergence of these technologies of connectivity over the last few years that the opportunities are immense. And I just want to talk a little bit about what you might do. So a number of people in my lab have been working on this problem of how do you help individuals learn how to do social problem solving? How do you build that skill? You know, we all go through our daily lives and we do everyday things. We go to the bowling alley, we go to the movie theater, we go to class. And we know how these things operate. We can tell people what the steps are, we know what those steps are. But we also know that often things get in the way. Something happens that's not ordinary and we have to stop, figure out how we're going to react and then move on with life. So you go with a friend to the movie theater, you get to the front of the line at the movie theater and the movie you wanted to see just sold out. What do you do? Seems to us like you know, we're mature adults, we can figure out what to do. There are lots of options. Let's step out and consider what our options are and, and go a different way. But those kinds of stumbling blocks sometimes can be paralyzing to an individual who doesn't understand social rules and doesn't understand how to consider options and what their implications are on the rest of the social world. So let's build a tool that helps them rehearse these skills. Because what they are good at, many of them, is learning rules. Even though they don't understand them, they can learn the rules and they can figure out how to get by. They can learn the game that we neurotypicals play so that they can survive in our world. But the problem with that is that there are so many different things you want to do in life and so many different uh, um, options and hurdles that can come about. It would be impossible, wouldn't it, to build a tool to help someone rehearse all the different things that they might do in their everyday life? Well, maybe. And if we built a tool and gave it to a mother and said, here, look, build these rich, interactive st stories that help your child go to you know, a fast food restaurant and figure out what to do when the food that they order is not there and, and they have to go to the bathroom and there are three people behind uh, standing in line. Just go and build that scenario and your, your child will be able to rehearse it. But that's crippling. Right? These are individuals that have busy lives. They have lots of children. We have to figure out a way to make it easier for them to build these kinds of scenarios. Ah, well the wonder of our technology today is that we can now reach, reach many, many different people. And we even have whole economies that have burst out that allow us to reach out to other people and get them to do our work for us. You may have heard of Amazon Mechanical Turk, artificial, artificial intelligence. Got a problem? Let a bunch of people help you solve it. So I want to build a rich scenario about how I go to a restaurant or how I go to a movie theater or a bowling alley. I want to know what all the steps are. Oh, it's not just a bowling alley. It's a bowling alley in my part of suburban Atlanta on a Saturday in the summer. Let's let a whole bunch of people tell us about what typically happens when you do that scenario. And let, let's let them tell us what are all the things that could go wrong. And let's them tell us what are all the different things you might do to consider getting around that particular problem so that it's not just left to the poor parent to develop or a poor teacher to develop that rich scenario. So let's leverage the technology of the, of the internet and reach out to other people to help them solve our problem. But you can also do this for the individual. Individual wants to live at home or in their own home independently. But they're going to have things they have to do every day to figure out what to do in that, that particular day. They may have a job interview at the end of a school day and they want to know what should I wear? And should I wear what I'm going to wear to the interview at 4 o'clock even though I've got a, a, a gym class and a bunch of classes in between? How do I figure out what to do. A parent would want to give the child some advice, but the parent might not be there, and the child might not want the parent to be there. So as the child stares at the mirror, or the young adult stare, stares in the mirror in the morning and has this question, what should I wear for this interview, why can't they reach out to a bunch of social networking sites and get answers from people? Well, one of the reasons that you might want to do this is because, throw something out on Twitter, someone is likely going to read it fairly quickly. But do you trust that person? So you've got to balance this notion of a quick response against a trusted and safe response. And that's a challenge that we're looking at right now. And so we have developed a prototype of a system that is to build a safe, trusted, but responsive social network that will allow individuals to get information or advice about their everyday life in the context of their daily schedule, as you'll see on the bottom there. 
It's a wonderful way to take our emerging social networking technologies and apply them to a problem that not only means a lot to that individual, but means an awful lot to the parents of that individual who so dearly want that person to be able to live independently, but are co concerned that just the simplest twitch in the schedule might throw them off for days or weeks. So I want to stop there. I've shown you two different examples. One, heavy on the sensing side, imaging behavior to be able to understand the phenomenon of a behavioral uh, uh, thing like autism so that we can diagnose and treat it more effectively, providing the right kinds of ways to view behavior. I've also talked about leveraging social networking and this internet and mobile technologies to allow us to get information, trusted information, if, when, and where we need it. Right? But I want to let you know that there's a larger message here. That I presented this as I started with family movies, I was slapped in the face with what happened with my own child, I was struggling trying to deal with autism in my own life, but autism is not a burden on me. It has been my opportunity. And all I want to say to you is you need to find your opportunity. Find the thing that makes you passionate. Get the skills you need to make a difference on that, pro uh, that particular problem and get on with it. So autism is my opportunity. And the last thing I want to say, as an information technologist, Information technology, IT, make IT, make it matter. That's the most important thing I think you could take away today. Thank you very much for your attention.